Apple on YouTube, and today I would like to talk to you about 1920s Japan and an anime called Taisho Baseball Girls. Taisho Baseball Girls is a late 2000s bishoujo anime directed by Takashi Ikehara of Genshiken fame. The story is based on a light novel and the show is licensed by Sentai Filmworks. Taisho Baseball Girls is exactly as it sounds. It is about girls playing baseball in the Taisho period. And this presentation is about the historical context surrounding those three things. Now, all these topics are pretty interconnected, but for simplicity's sake, we'll tackle them one at a time. So when was the Taisho era? Taisho period, Taisho reign, whatever you want to call it. The Taisho period is a relatively short span of only 14 years, starting in 1912 and ending in 1925. It's part of the Japanese calendar system, which is based on the reign of Japan's emperors. So the Meiji era marks the reign of Emperor Meiji, the Taisho era for Emperor Taisho, and the Showa era for Emperor Showa and the Heisei era for Emperor Akihito. Each emperor is named after their era after they die, and Emperor Akihito is still alive, so that's why he breaks the pattern. Japan still uses this calendar system. Years are reset at the beginning of each era, and then you count forward from there. So, for example, we are currently in the Reiwa era, which started in 2019. So counting from 2019, 2020, and 2021, we are currently in the third year of the Reiwa era. So what was actually happening in and around the Taisho era? This is a very condensed timeline of 20th century Japan. Starting with the Meiji Restoration, this marks the end of the era of samurai. Political power is taken from the shogunate and is restored to the emperor. This also marks Japan opening up its borders to the rest of the world, which means they can start fighting their neighbors and grow an empire. They fight China in 1894, then Russia in 1904, and Korea in 1910, and Korea is annexed into Japan and becomes a colony of Japan. Then World War I happens and Japan declares war on Germany because it wants to take over some islands in the Pacific that belonged to Germany at that time. And then Japan is hit by the Great Kanto Earthquake and this does a ton of damage and Japan has to do a lot of rebuilding afterwards. Then it fights China again and finally enters World War II, which ends in the atomic bombing and the occupation of the country by the U.S. The U.S. rewrites Japan's constitution, Korea is given independence, women are given the right to vote, and the emperor must admit that he is no longer divine. Once the occupation ends in 1952, Japan gets back on its feet and hosts the Olympics in 1964, and from that point it starts to resemble the pop culture epicenter that we see it as today. Taisho Baseball Girls takes place right here in 1925, the last year of the Taisho period. And this show goes above and beyond in reminding you of its setting. The way the characters talk about things, whether it's reminding you about inflation, or if it's about how Japan hasn't fully integrated the metric system yet, there's all these little details that have been slipped in. Even how the characters write is outdated. And all of these small things add up and really make the Taisho period feel like a character in and of itself in this show. That being said, Taisho Baseball Girls does provide an idealized view of the period. There are all sorts of terrible things happening in this period, like World War I and the Spanish Flu, but these two examples were sort of seen as taking place outside of Japan. These events were happening out in the world, 
you could feel the effects at home, but they weren't happening at home. But the Taisho era also had domestic disasters as well. The worst being the Great Kanto Earthquake. It's been estimated to have been about an 8 on the Richter scale. The Richter scale actually hadn't been invented yet when it happened. But the devastation was immense. What wasn't leveled by the earthquake itself was burned to the ground by fires that the earthquake had started. Tokyo was totally destroyed. Many survivors have lost their homes and businesses and are looking for someone to blame. This is a time of great nationalism for the Japanese. And in the days following the earthquake, hundreds of Koreans living in Japan are murdered in the streets for supposedly causing the earthquake. So Taisho Baseball Girls is not actually a show about war, disaster, or death. It does technically acknowledge these events, though. There's a musical number in the first episode where Komei does a song and dance over a timeline of the entire era, and the timeline includes things like World War I and the earthquake, but it also has a lot of international events. There's a little bit of dissonance where Komei marches over these events, some of which killed hundreds of thousands of people, while this peppy song plays, and the Sentai release of the show doesn't translate anything on the timeline, so it's hard to know what's even going on at first. So the show acknowledges all of these events at the very beginning, but then quickly moves on to what it actually wants to focus on. And that focus is on how this is a time of cultural shifts for Japan. Clothes, food, Everything was starting to change since Japan opened its borders, and the Taisho period witnesses some of these larger shifts. The country is basically a mix of Japanese tradition and Western progress, and Komei and Akiko make wonderful aesthetic foils where Komei is a homegrown heroine from a typical Japanese family, and Akiko is a prissy ojo sama from a wealthy family that lives in a big western mansion. For the government, westernization is about growing your military and your empire. But for your average citizen, westernization is about struggling to choose which parts of Japan's culture you want to cherish and which parts of shiny new western culture you want to embrace. Technology is something where it's hardly a choice. Not just Japan, but the whole world is embracing new technology from this period. And most of this technology isn't actually relevant to the show, but they showcase it in the opening and ending. But I do want to go over the technology that does appear in the actual story. So first up is electric streetcars. These were introduced to Tokyo around 1910-1911. And before they were introduced, they actually had horse-drawn cars, like that one you can see on the left. But these were very expensive and slow, and the general public didn't really use them. You can see on that map on the left a very small red loop, where that's the route that these cars would take. The electric trams were faster and cheaper, and they didn't leave poop on the ground, and they could cover so much more distance. And you can see the web of red roots that these trams covered in Tokyo. And soon different tram companies are competing within Tokyo. In Taisho Baseball Girls, the trams we see are green, and the green trams were operated by the Tokyo Shingai Tetsudo Company. Um, this company would eventually merge with a bunch of other companies and then get bought out by the Japanese government. And during the time that the show actually takes place, tram use would have been down because after the earthquake, it took a really long time to get the rails up and running again and buses would eventually become cheaper and popular as a result. 
But Tokyo's electric streetcar system is really the first harbinger of Tokyo's contemporary subway system. So the other exciting mode of transportation we have is automobiles. The first domestically produced cars in Japan would come from Mitsubishi and DAT, which would eventually turn into Nissan. Now, mass produce is a little bit of a misleading term here, where they only actually made these models in the dozens. Japan's car industry wouldn't really take off until the 1930s. Cars are actually pretty rare in Tokyo, especially for personal use, where they're usually used as taxi cabs. And those taxi cabs are a type of imported Ford model. But of course, Akiko, with her fabulously wealthy family, can afford to import a car for personal use and hire a driver. So if you don't have the money for a personal car and you're going somewhere that isn't far enough to justify a taxi and it's somewhere that isn't along the electric streetcar route, you could take a rickshaw, which was still a popular mode of transportation back in the Taisho era. You can still see rickshaw today in a lot of Japanese cities, but they are mostly used for tours rather than a legitimate mode of getting around the city. We also see a bunch of telephones in the show. So telephones were introduced to Japan by Alexander Graham Bell himself. He personally went to Japan to sell his products and the Taisho era is when they started appearing in middle-class homes. The girls are actually studying a Graham Bell quote in class. And I actually couldn't find a source for this quote being published before the 1930s. So either there is an older source for it and I just couldn't find it, or this is a little bit of a hiccup in the show's accuracy. Before the Taisho era, the phones were a lot more likely to look a bit more like that model on the left. They would have been installed in places like post offices where they would be available for the public to use. And Japan also followed suit with the US where phone operators were usually female. By the time the show takes place, the candlestick model of phones would have been more popular in Japan. We also see Noriko of the Newspaper Club use a few cameras during the show. 1925 was the year that the first 35mm film camera was introduced. It was introduced in Germany. There aren't a lot of details on Noriko's handheld camera there on the right, and it's a little hard to believe that she would have gotten her hands on one by the time that the show takes place but you never know. And she also has a stationary camera that uses the traditional glass plates rather than film, which would have been more common around this time. And finally, we have moving film. We have movies. There is a whole filler episode about how someone is shooting a movie and Komei gets recruited to be in it, and it is just so that way they can show off the movie technology from the time. Movies were still black and white and silent, and you had to crank the physical film inside of the camera to capture whatever you were filming. And when silent films were played in the theater in the US, they would usually be accompanied by some kind of music, maybe piano or an orchestra, but in Japan, they were always accompanied by a narrator that would sit to the side and basically tell the audience what was happening on screen. The same way a narrator functions during a play. And this approach would feed into some of the stylistic differences between Western and Japanese films. While not related to the content of Taisho Baseball Girls, and more so related to its medium, 
A short animated film called Namakura Gatana debuted in 1917 and is considered by many to be Japan's first domestic animation. The film is very crude by today's standards, but the Taisho era does mark the beginning of Japan's animation industry. Let's talk about baseball. Baseball is incredibly popular in Japan. It's called yaku, or literally field ball, and it is one of the few foreign concepts that is written with a kanji in Japanese. From a linguistic perspective, baseball is not British, it's not American, it is Japanese. So baseball was introduced to Japan in 1872 by Horace Wilson, and he was an English teacher at a Tokyo boys' school at the time. He has an exhibit in the Japanese Baseball Hall of Fame, and there are statues dedicated to him, and his story is reflected in Ms. Kirtland. She is the girl's English teacher. She is from America, and she is the one that teaches them the rules of baseball and how to actually play it. As far as American characters go in anime, I actually like Miss Kirtland. She does have the stereotypical blonde hair and blue eyes, and she does put random English interjections into her speech, but she's never presented as being stupid or brutish, and so it's nice how she breaks that stereotype. So baseball has been around for a while in Japan, but the 1920s is when it really starts to take off on a professional level. But of course, all of those formal teams, both school teams and professional leagues, are all male. And this is where we have the core conflict of Taisho Baseball Girls, where it is not proper for girls to be playing baseball at this time. This is a huge point of tension between Komei and her father. And even though her family makes a living running a Western-style restaurant, Komei's father hypocritically opposes Westernization and doesn't want Komei wearing Western clothes or really doing anything that is improper for a Japanese girl to do. And this brings us to our last part, girls, and by extension, women. So stateside, we think of the 1920s as this tremendous leap in women's rights where the U.S. ratifies the 19th Amendment and white women across the country are able to vote. Voting rights in Japan around this time have a different focus. In 1925, Japan passes the Universal Manhood Suffrage Law, and all men over 25 in the empire can vote regardless of property ownership. This law passing actually really pisses off Japanese feminists from this time, because it explicitly states that they're being excluded from suffrage on the basis of their sex. It wasn't an issue of women not being property owners or not meeting some other type of specification. And on top of that, now there's men that have never set foot in Japan and live in places like Korea and Taiwan that now have more political rights than women that were born and raised in Japan. And it's not a simple matter of women just need to protest more and fight for the right to vote, because just a few years prior to this, Japanese feminists were furiously fighting to amend something called Article 5 of the Public Peace Police Law. This is a law that forbid women from joining political parties or attending political rallies. Women have very little control, both politically and personally. Women can't even necessarily choose the partners that they want to marry. There's this thing called the EA family system, where each family is expected to have a male head. This could be a father or a grandfather or maybe even an uncle. And legally, you have to get your family's head's permission to do anything related to marriage or divorce 
or legitimizing children. The concept of marrying for love is actually a recent Western import that comes from Christianity, and it doesn't really take off until after World War II when the family system is abolished. There's tons and tons of pre-war Japanese literature about how love is found outside of marriages. It's found in trysts and affairs and at brothels. And women can't be open about who they actually like. And so culturally, you have to develop all these little symbols and signs. So things like what kind of flowers you send or how you word your letters really matters because they can be misinterpreted as something a bit more scandalous. As Kome learns firsthand, where she is late and running with her breakfast in her mouth, which is a rice ball, because sliced bread hasn't caught on yet in Japan, and even though it's the Taisho period, it's still anime, and she rounds the corner and bumps into some guy and drops all of her stuff and has to pick it up and runs off and the guy is totally smitten and realizes that she left a handkerchief behind and is convinced that this was the secret sign that she did this on purpose and this must be a love confession. Because again, coming out and saying these things is incredibly taboo, especially for women. But there are some women that go against the grain during this time. Modern girl is a term coined by Junichiro Tanizaki in his book Naomi. Modern girls are young women who like western clothes and western movies and sometimes they even dare to drink and smoke in public. In the book, the modern girl represents everything that men both fear and find attractive about westernization. From the female perspective, we have terms like new women. New women is an explicitly feminist term. It comes from the New Women's Association founded in 1920. They are associated with a magazine called Blue Stocking, that's the cover of the first issue on the right. Blue Stockings contributors write about politics, philosophy, and even their own love lives. And then they publish it for all the world to see. This is so shocking that the Japanese government actually bans Blue Stocking for being a danger to public order. But the modern girls and new women are a little older than the girls in Taisho Baseball Girls. The girls in the anime are still at an age where they're receiving a basic education. This is the highest formal education that they can receive because women cannot earn university degrees in Japan at this time. Originally, Japan's secondary education system only had boys' schools. No one wanted to cough up the money to educate girls they didn't see the point. But in 1899, a law is passed that each prefecture must have at least one public girls' school. Kuroda Kiyotaka is oddly pro-girls' education during this time, and under the reasoning that educated mothers raise better soldiers, he says, efficient colonization requires able men raised by educated mothers to produce which schools for girls must be founded. There's this educational philosophy that finds its way into school curriculums during this time called Rosai Kembo, and it's a set phrase in Japanese and it means good wife, wise mother, where these are seen as the only roles suitable for women. It disappears from textbooks after World War II, but you can still hear it as a phrase 
that people say sometimes in Japan. And sometimes you can even hear it in anime if you're listening for it. But there is something else from the education system in this time period that you can spot in almost every anime. The Seifuku. It is the hot new trend for schoolgirls across Japan. So before the Seifuku, girls would wear just kimono to school. Sometimes there would be a uniform where you had to wear a certain kind, like the Hakama style in the photo on the left. Seifuku are credited to Elizabeth Lee. She was the principal at a Christian girls' school in Fukuoka during the 1920s. She was American, but she had visited Britain in her youth, where she had seen British naval sailors and based the uniforms off of those. That photo on the right is what her uniforms looked like, and the idea spread all across Japan. The Western style uniforms were praised for comfort and convenience and, most of all, mobility. Wearing a seifuku as opposed to a kimono allowed girls to run from danger. There are accounts from the Great Kanto Earthquake that many young women were unable to evacuate buildings before they collapsed simply because they could not run in their kimono. So the switch to the seifuku wasn't a matter of fashion, but one of autonomy and safety for girls. So in Taisho Baseball Girls, the cast wears a mix of hakama and seifuku. Their school allows them to choose either as an acceptable uniform. But not only are these girls a mix of Eastern and Western fashion, but they also are a mix of socioeconomic backgrounds. The reason a prim and proper lady like Akiko is attending the same school as girls like Kome is probably because there just weren't that many schools for girls. Even after each prefecture is obligated to have at least one girl's school, still no one really wants to cough up the money to establish the same amount of girl's schools as there are boys' schools, and this gap gets filled in by Christian missionaries, mostly from America, who are the ones willing to go out of their way to educate Japanese girls. And this is where we get the origins of Class S Yuri. All girls' schools, where you address the girls in higher grades than you as Onesama, and between praying at mass and having your seifuku blow into the wind wistfully, you have passionate friendships that are never quite homosexual at least not explicitly, and in Taisho Baseball Girls, Kyoko and Tomoe Onesama are the representatives for Class S Yuri, because this is the time period that lays the foundation for this genre to start showing up in novels and manga no less than about a decade later. So not only are girls' schools ripe for friendship, but it's where Japan starts developing a unique girls' culture. Shoujo no Tomo, or Girl's Friend, gets mentioned by name in the anime, and Shoujo no Tomo is one of the publications from this time that was very popular among young girls and was illustrated by the fabulous and influential Junichi Nakahara. It is also one of the publications that kicks off shoujo manga. So there's this widespread myth that shoujo manga started with Tezuka's Princess Knight that came out in the 1950s, but there was already manga aimed at girls running in pre-war magazines like Shoujo no Tomo. So some of the confusion might stem from how 
Shoujo no Tomo was not exclusively a manga magazine. It had short stories and poems and all sorts of stuff. And Tezuka's Princess Night was one of the first manga to be published in a girls magazine exclusively for manga. But if you look at what was in Shoujo no Tomo, things like the mysterious clover there on the upper right, they're pretty similar to things like Princess Knight and other post-war manga that claim to be the first of their kind. So why should you bother watching Taisho Baseball Girls? There's a bunch more recent and more popular anime set in the Taisho period, like Demon Slayer and Mars Red, and you could check those out instead if you want. But if you're a little tired of fantasy anime and you want something that's not only more historically accurate, but really goes out of its way to capture the feeling of an era and focuses not on world wars, but personal battles about proving who you are and what you can do, Taisho Baseball Girls is the underrated gem for that. And I hope I've convinced you of that today. Here are some of my sources and where you can find me as well as some recommended further reading. Thank you for watching and have a good weekend. Okay. There we go. Well, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Minton. I go by Otupple One Half on uh, Twitter and YouTube. And uh, yeah, I have uh, used to do a lot of convention panels, and then I moved to Japan and lived there for about two years. And then I came back to the U.S. just in time for 2020. Um, and so here I am now. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, so yeah, so so Taisho Baseball Girls. Um, how, how much did you, uh, or was there anything that Taisho Baseball Girls kind of um, taught you or kind of revealed to you about that period that you didn't already know? So the Taisho period, since it's so short and it kind of gets uh, put together with the Meiji period a lot of the time, mm. and even I mix them up sometimes because a lot of the literature that gets published during the Taisho period is about the Meiji period. And uh. like, the biggest example is is like Kokoro Nats Natsume Soseki, uh, mm. where it, the whole book is, is about the Meiji period, but it was published in the Taisho period. And uh. so you kind of forget that because, um, you know, it's more looking back on, uh, you know, looking back on the Meiji period where... Mm. Uh, the Taisho period is weird because it's so short. Mm. Uh, but it was also really crucial because that early 1920s um, was when a lot of westernization was getting properly adopted by the public. Mm. Uh, and it's when a lot of the social change that was happening everywhere, even you know in the U.S., um, you know, people were at least hearing about it. Mm. Um, and so it's a really interesting period mm. um, because there's a lot happening, but it's also a really forgettable period <laughs> where I don't think I like, you know, because you, you, before you like learn the history and, and get it all down, you kind of mm. hear the names floating around like, oh, mm. Meiji, Showa. Um, I don't think I actually knew the Taisho period by name until I watched Taisho mm -hmm. Baseball Girls. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Um, that totally makes sense. Yeah, and, and now that I think about it, you know, you have the, the Great Kanto Earthquake in there, which also would have, you know, spawned a lot of, you know, reconstruction and, you know, okay, now it's time to redo things. That totally makes sense. Um, so, yeah, um, I know you, you touched on this in, some in, in the panel, but... Um, you know, baseball is obviously one of those things that's like really, really big in Japan. Um, to an extent, I think a lot of, of Americans don't realize. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, how how would you say? Um, how would you say that baseball is kind of 
um, similar or different than it is in America in terms of just sort of like natural acceptance or just how much people watch it or that kind of stuff? I would say baseball is a bigger deal in Japan than it is in America wow. because like, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of like the you know culture like i think of like you know you you go to the baseball stadium and you eat a hot dog that's just what you do <laughs> um but i mean japan has koshien where yeah. it's this national broadcasted high school <laughs> baseball tournament that everybody's taking really seriously um and uh, Japan still looks to America for for baseball. There's kind of a very mm. cliche like childhood dream for young boys where they're mm. gonna become a baseball player and then play in America. Mm. Um, but it is definitely really different. I feel mm. like uh, like a lot of uh, you know baseball is more akin to i think something like the the super bowl for americans where uh, like everybody's kind of you know at least aware of when it's happening mm -hmm. even if you don't care about the sport mm -hmm. um like koshian is playing on like tvs and restaurants and bars wow. and like it's it's something that you you're at least like aware that when it's happening mm -hmm. <laughs> um so yeah, and then of course there's the huge uh, anime connection. I mean, I I feel like it, this isn't as true anymore, but in the 2000s it felt like every show needed a baseball episode. <laughs> like the baseball episode was crucial. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, if it was the 70s, you had to have a soccer episode. If it was a yeah, um, no, totally. Um, and one of the things I also find interesting about this is how much it focuses on kind of the girls' experience. Um, and about how much, um, like the, the whole thing about the, the school uniforms and how, you know, um, <laughs> um, I'm actually sending my girl to middle school. I ain't going to buy her a whole new you know, uniform. Um, um, how, how much did you see that um, reflected in the show versus um, like real life? Um, so, I mean... Um, obviously, like, uh, most schools in Japan are co-ed at this point, mm. and, like, you know, um, I, I mean, like, uh, only middle school is, like, legally required, but most people go on to high school, um, mm. and then college, um, yeah. and so it's interesting seeing, uh, in the show, like, kind of how much of a struggle it is, where not only... Um, are they kind of in this old rickety wooden schoolhouse? But like, mm. there's um, a point early in the show where they go to visit uh, the boys practicing, and like the boys have like a whole like stadium. <laughs> little, like they got they got bleachers, they got like the whole field, um, you know. And so it's good at kind of illustrating how there there is this gap, mm. um, and how that does influence, you know, how things are today, where mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I mean, the main thing is, you know, uh, scandals with how, uh, like, test scores for getting into high school and college in Japan, uh, where basically, at this point, Japan has, like, affirmative action for boys, because wow. they're all, like, scoring too high, and <laughs> it's kind of... And it's not really in the name of diversity. It's kind of in the name of like, well, we don't, we don't really want to admit this this many girls. Like, why would we want to do that? It's kind of like, okay. Hmm. Um, so it's it's interesting because it's you know how far we've come and mm. and yet you know how little we've come. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, and yeah, and it's and, and I know you're saying in the panel, it's fascinating seeing a show that is oddly like this this lighthearted um given kind of a subject matter you know so often it gets really dramatic yeah and i mean at the end of the day it, it is kind of a cute girl anime mm -hmm. it is um i mean there there's it's only one core and yet there's filler episodes where it's like <laughs> let's shoot a movie let's like <laughs> run around town challenging like boys in the night to like these pitcher face-offs like let's you know, let, let's do some wacky thing. Oh, and also, like, we're working towards this goal. Um, but that's just what makes it so charming. And, like, it it really just 
makes it, you know, feel good, even though, um, mm. like, there, there's kind of this serious topic, uh, but at the same time, like, it's kind of about these girls just learning to work together. Like, mm. it's not even that they're uniting, you know, against an enemy. It's mm. literally just kind of, they're learning to, you know, have each other's backs and, yeah. and get along. That was a great point that it's that um, it's kind of set amidst all of this social upheaval, but it's not about all the social upheaval. Yeah. yeah. And and tacking on to that, like, it's also interesting because, I mean, the, the social upheaval and the, you know, political stuff. I mean, young girls are pretty much the the farthest you can get from that. Uh, true. Yeah. So that's kind of another interesting part of it where seeing how much actually affects their lives despite mm. being so separated from everything hmm. um, because of their age, because of, you know, the political status of women and whatnot. Um, and yet they're still, you know, facing these really basic, you know, conflicts mm. that uh, might not register the same if it were about, you know, a group of boys. Sure, totally. Um Ginger asked in the chat room, do we know where this is set? And I was actually Googling, and I didn't see anything about, like, is that a particular prefecture? Like, is it in Tokyo? It's it's basically in Shinjuku. It is in Tokyo. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I believe I believe it's Shinjuku. Um, I know that on the Sentai release, um, I think they have, like, a note that pops up on the screen. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's basically uh, Shinjuku 1920s. Cool. And um, that's uh, that's why it's significant that the tram cars are green because those were the cars. Oh, were. cool! Right, yeah. yeah, that's really awesome. Cool. Was there anything else you wanted to uh, to mention before we wrap up? Yeah. Uh, so if you liked this, I made another Taisho Baseball Girls video. It's up on my channel. Uh, you can look up Otapel O T A P L. It might. Uh, O-T-A-P-L-E. It might be easier to just type in, like, Hypnosis Mike, and you'll find my most okay. popular video. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, it's only two and a half minutes. But, mm. uh, yeah, if you want to check out more of my stuff, uh, I'm mostly on YouTube now. Um, and my Twitter is Otuple1Half, and you can...